Uh, hello and welcome to today's webinar where we're going to be discussing uh, the current short and the long-term outlook for LNG markets and we're going to be taking uh, specifically a, a deep dive look at the current pipeline of project spending across supply and demand. Uh, and to help us do this, I'm delighted to be joined by not one, but by two of our industry subject matter experts. We have Shane Mullins, who is our VP of Product Development, and Jesus Davies, who is our Director of Oil and Gas Research to North America. Now, before we do that, we'd like to take a look, if we may, Shane, at our sponsor. Uh, a big thank you to uh, the folks over at ITT Gould Pumps. Uh, the folks over there, they, they're suppliers of pumps for the LNG liquefaction plants, including acid gas removal, natural gas liquids, and utilities such as cooling water and steam generation. They also manufacture large horizontal and vertical pumps used to convert the LNG back into gas as well as uh, producing and manufacturing other pumps for balancing part plant requirements. Uh, and obviously these pumps can be equipped with ITT's new best-in-class automated machine health diagnostics. So guys, many thanks for your support today. Now, Shane, if we could just take a quick look at uh, the agenda today. Um, obviously coming into the start of the year, we were already seeing some pressure on LNG markets due to a growing oversupply. Um, this was something that, that was to some extent being managed by increasing demand coming out of Europe, but obviously what we've seen this year with COVID and that COVID-driven economic slowdown, we've seen um, you know, that slowdown across now most markets. Uh, and this has really further intensified pressure, certainly on the upstream liquefaction side of the supply chain. And also uh, to some extent added a little bit of cost advantage back to buyers, although they have obviously been beneficiaries of this supply demand imbalance. So hopefully that's going to be a really interesting discussion I think that we'll be able to have today. Um, and I think I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So Shane, if I may, uh, if we could bring you very quickly into the discussion and, and could you just talk us through some of, I guess, the, the, the history of how LNG supp uh, supply and regasification capacity has developed over the last few years? Yeah, just to get that started, uh, this slide and, and the two that follow uh, sum up the liquefaction capacity that's you know been added each year, with liquefaction being on the left and LNG regas import terminal installations on the right. In uh, 2018, about 45% uh, of the project capacity scheduled for startup was delayed into 2019, which really helped keep the market in balance, but also set up uh, you know, 2019 for really being the beginning of, a, of, of an oversupply period. Uh, one notable exception was uh, Novatex Mall Train 3, which was commissioned a year ahead of uh, the original schedule. Uh, four projects in total reached FID in uh, 2018. We saw the Corpus Christi, uh, Chenier's Corpus Christi Train 3, LNG Canada, the Greater Tour 2 project, their FLNG, and also the Tango FLNG in Argentina received approval back then. Uh, the 28 metric ton per annum of new supplies that started up at, uh, really at a time when markets such as Japan and Korea were no longer growing, but uh, at the same time, 32 new markets were opening up globally. As, as we look at last year, we saw about $56 billion in new liquefaction investment reach commercial startup, mainly in the USA, but also this represents the tail end of Australia's wave of LNG investments that were completed. Um, you saw the, the long delayed IMPEX Ithacus uh, Train 2 and Shell's Prelude FLNG project reach commercial startup last year. And we also saw a substantial increase in regasification additions. This year, the startup, uh, uh, we, we're seeing the startup of Southern, uh, uh, Elba, uh, Southern companies, Elba Island, Freeport LNG, and remaining trains of Cameron LNG facilities in the USA. and and that's being followed up by two, uh, two trains in Russia, most no notably Yamal's Train 4, which, although small, is Russia's foray into the Arctic Cascade technology. And uh, their development of, of their own technology really just uh, 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 is really a, a major milestone for them. And, and one of the main reasons why we feel there's going to be more LNG development out of Russia going forward. Uh, one trend that is evident that uh, is going to be uh, 
uh, over the next few years is that receiving terminal capacity completions is outpacing uh, the supply trend, and, and that's going to continue. Uh, typically, you do, though, need about two and a half tons of regas capacity for every ton of LNG liquefaction that comes online uh, just to keep uh, the market in balance. Uh, global utilization of receiving terminals, you know, just recently has been 40 percent, uh, while uh, LNG liquefaction trains last year were at 95 percent. And uh, but we did see um, uh, 42 metric ton per annum uh, coming online this year, and that represents about 4.4 billion in investment. All right. Hey, thanks, Shane. So <clears throat> this is a view of our uh, new Tableau LNG report. And this tool basically helps us summarize all those capacity additions that uh, Shane just discussed, as well as the uh, existing fleet. So it just helps us visualize basically hundreds of projects and unit profiles to see high-level views of the, of the overall market. So in this particular view, we're able to see geographically where the capacity currently exists. And you can also see the growth over time. So you can see where Shane just mentioned from 2018 to 2020, you know, that, that growth of, you know, <clears throat> The additional capacity, I think, is an additional 34 trains that we added over those two years. That was over or nearly 88 million tons per annum that was added. Um, the bulk of those additions were in the U.S. and Australia, U.S., Australia, and Russia. Um, and that's those additions have helped m make the U.S. move uh, into a, a global leader in the LNG production uh, world. We're uh, now in, at number three in in terms of LNG liquefaction capacity. And going on to the next slide, you can see. Where again, you know, we've added significant amount of capacity. You can see, you know, 50, 51.7 million tons per annum added in the U.S. You know, just took so that really took us from you know nowhere on the list to to the number three spot. Then Australia continue to uh, continue with their their final wave, and then Russia added new capacity. So overall, we're looking at about 441 million uh, metric tons globally uh, operational. And according to the International Gas Union, this allowed uh, LNG trade to reach 355 million metric tons last year. There's still over another $500 billion worth of uh, LNG development on, on the books. You know, that's an additional 700 million metric tons. There's over 20 countries that are currently developing additional um, LNG export uh, capacity. Uh, countries that we did not include on the list, you still have other countries like Argentina, Iran, Oman. That are still that are also considering adding a new liquefaction capacity. Um, just a few weeks ago, Russia came out and said, I think it's specifically Novatech. Russia's Novatech came out and said that they were looking to add another to produce, be able to produce 70 million metric tons per annum of LNG capacity by 2030, despite what's going on um, with the the pandemic right now. But if you really look at what you know, <clears throat> what's what's occurring right now, you have Qatar that's potentially going to add another 30 million metric tons. We're expecting that project to reach FID next year. So that will take them to being able to produce over 100 million tons a year of, of LNG. So they'll regain that top spot from Australia. And then North America, we're still looking at another 20, 21 million metric tons of capacity that's currently under construction right now. And then, like I said, uh, Russia, currently they have you know 20.7 million tons uh, under construction. But like I uh, just said, they, they're looking to continue to grow that even more. And if we kind of just pop back to our Tableau report, what we've done here is summarized the project activity that's under construction that's expected to be complete over the next 18 months. Currently, there's another 12 trains under construction, and this will add another you know, 21, maybe 22 million metric tons of, of uh, capacity, um, with over half of that uh, occurring here in the, in the U.S. That'll take total liquefaction, liquefaction capacity to about 460 million metric tons. And then if we extend that timeline a little bit, you know, looking at the next slide, and looking at everything that's under construction, there's a total of 54 million metric tons of capacity that are that are expected to be complete by 2025. That takes us to nearly you know, 500 million tons per annum of, uh, of capacity with the U.S. taking the lead in that liquefaction capacity. But as I said earlier, when uh, Qatar moves forward with that, with that massive expansion that they have proposed, that'll put them back in the lead. Um, but I do want to mention specifically in regards to our Tableau report, not only can it uh, summarize the LNG liquefaction capacity, we could also produce, it also produces the same views for regasification capacities and projects, LNG storage capacities and additions, as well as planned and, un and unplanned offline events, um, whether it's uh, maintenance, uh, weather events like the hurricanes that we've seen in the, in the U.S. over the past few weeks or few, past few months, I'm sorry, as well as unplanned mechanical issues, 
um, that are going on in places like Gorgon or Prelude or even uh, some of the ones we've experienced in the U.S. Um, over the past years, or also other unplanned events like uh, fires. Um, I think um, uh, Equinor, their uh, Hammerfest plant, there was a fire over there the past couple weeks, and you'll be able to see the impact of those uh, of those events through our Tableau tool. It just shows you how much capacity has been uh, removed from the market um, for any of those events, or as well as, uh, like I said, cap capacity additions as well. Great stuff. So Shane, if we could uh, bring you back into the discussion. Uh, now, much of this new liquefaction capacity um, that we've just seen presented in a previous few slides, obviously a lot of that has been geared towards that mid to long-term demand growth profile that Asia has been presenting, and I think probably still does present. Uh, and in particular, a lot of that rests really clearly with what China is, uh, how China plays out. Now, with demand projected to be slightly softer, certainly over the short term, and new supply coming to market, how are prices responding? Um, and are prices at levels where they're sufficient to support the timing of the new next wave of LNG liquefaction investments? Well, if you just look at uh, LNG pricing a year ago, back in October, you know we were hovering around five to six dollars for for comparison purposes. As we entered this year, you know, as you mentioned earlier, we had mild weather demand in an oversupplied market, which is hammering prices in Asia and Europe. And But now with the COVID-related shutdowns, prices really collapsed in April. And um, U.S. Henry Hub gas prices uh, became, at least for a short period of time, more expensive than landed spot prices. And uh, there, there really is no previous downturn that compares to this. Um, Average LNG prices have improved, but uh, if you look at just an average for 2020, we're going to end up in the $3 per BTU range. Uh, uh, we're not going to end the year that way. That's just the, the range for the year as far as an average. Uh, but uh, this is effectively pushing out pipeline imports in China and Europe, and uh, 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 which is helping LNG demand. But uh, spot prices are likely to, going to remain below 2019 levels. Uh, here in the shorter term over the next couple of years until the uh, uh, the shutdowns uh, end. If we just look at this from a, a global trade perspective and what kind of an impact the COVID shutdowns are having, we're, we're likely to see a 4% a over uh, downturn over last year or roughly uh, will be down to about uh, 340 million metric tons per annum of trade this year from the 355 that we saw last year. Uh, uh, we are expecting a sharp, sharp recovery in, in demand next year, and this is going to, but even with that uh, recovery, there's a really a two year delay in year over year demand growth at a time when a lot of new LNG supplies have recently entered the market. And uh, that two year delay that we're seeing is, is really affecting previous projections for a su supply and demand balance. Uh, you know, a year ago, we would have said we'd be back in balance in 2025, and now it's looking like it's going to be, uh, you know, a shortly in 2027 or perhaps as late as uh, 2028. So, Shane, looking at uh, that demand profile going forward, obviously the ongoing transition to lower carbon energy supply systems, and with it that growth of renewables in the electricity markets, um, you know, we, we, could we be seeing some challenges to, to gas demand? We're seeing much lower technology costs, levelized costs associated with both solar and wind. Uh, battery storage te technologies are, are starting to fall and becoming a little bit more scalable. Um, so will this, will the renewables piece start to sort of question some of the rationale for long-term gas demand? Could it create some kind of headwind? Uh, the, potentially the upstream certainly on the liquefaction side, may, to, may need to start factoring into some of their investment plans. Yes, it, it has impacted, um, but if, if you just look at a heat map of the natural gas-fired power development that still remains under development despite the incredible uh, uptick in renewables development, uh, this, this slide alone really kind of represents that huge shift that both BP and Shell are seeing towards natural gas in the power uh, sector. 
um, the, the growing focus on decarbonization and the gap is narrowing between oil and coal uh, to, uh, to imported gas competition in, in many parts of the world. Uh, right now, there's still $613 billion in natural gas-fired power under development. There's uh, 1,843 power projects representing about 540 gigawatts worth of development activity. Um, not all of this demand is going to be met by LNG trade, but when you look at the uh, geographical heat map of the development, it's, easy, it's really easier to see why LNG uh, trade is going to be growing faster than pipeline for supplying uh, uh, gas-fired power development over the, over the near term. If we just uh, look at what the potential is from a, a gas demand standpoint, uh, it you know global gas demand really resides at about 385 BCF a day or 10.9 billion cubic meters per day, and that's projected to grow overall at 2% per year out to 2030. Uh, LNG demand is going to be growing at a much faster, higher pace, and uh, depending on who you're talking to, three and a half to five percent on average out to 2030, and three to 4% out to 2040. Uh, but currently, the, there's right now 111 gigawatts of new gas-fired capacity under construction. That's going to add about 17 BCF a day of peak daily gas demand and another 7 BCF a day uh, if you look at it from a standpoint of a fleet utilization of 41%. Uh, we've laid out the uh, what the demand looks like at this point from all the projects currently under development. Uh, there's, there's a noticeable drop-off after 2025 on this chart. Uh, you know, please note that this is not a forecast. These are real projects and active development that have been rolled up into the slide. And we do expect that there will be more projects announced and moving forward in the 2026 to 2030 timeframe as we, we get closer to those years. Now, just to do another heat map, these are available in our, in our current suite of tools to anyone that's a client. Um, just looking at regasification capacity that's under development, um, there's a uh, you know 185 regasification terminal projects that could potentially import an additional 800 million tons per annum of, of new regasification capability, or at least potentially uh, provide that much uh, capability. It's uh, it's not only the availability of LNG, but that's opening up new markets, but the availability of lower cost technologies for infrastructure. FS, FSRU's uh, storage regasification units are, are a real game changer, and they're really needed right now. Uh, if you're if you're looking at investing in a 40-year land-based asset and you're questioning whether or not there could be peak LNG demand in, in that time frame, it's a lot easier to make a decision to go with a, um, uh, an FSRU-based um, uh, installation. Just moving on to what that build-out looks like um, in a, um, a cumulative graph. Whether you believe global LNG demand is projected to grow between three and a half or five percent per year, this is where the growth is going to come from. Uh, this image is taken from the LNG regas widget, which updates daily from the projects that we're tracking globally. All of our clients have access to this uh, on uh, uh, PECWeb. And uh, right now, that again, that stands at 132 billion in active development, 819 metric ton per annum of regas capacity in the development stage. Um, if you click on any of these uh, countries in, in, the, in the widget, it'll take you to the list of projects, the decision makers, the email addresses, the, the EPC firms that are involved in these projects, who's working on the feed. All of that's in the database behind uh, a widget of this nature. Uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the stats that we're tracking right now, uh, we, we imported about 355 metric ton per annum according to the International Gas Unit, that was a gas union. Uh, that represented about a 40% utilization rate. And uh, there's about 42 metric ton per annum being added this year. There's another 182 metric ton per annum in, in construction currently. And there's another 76 metric ton per annum that's been approved. Uh, and with that, just with what's under construction and then approved, we'll be at 1,129 metric ton per annum by 2025. At that same utilization rate that we saw last year, global trade could reach 451 metric ton per annum. And that would be a 5% annual growth rate with just completing what's already been approved. Now, after that, there's an additional 545 metric ton per annum still in the planning stages. And if only 40% of that capability moves forward through to completion by 2030, uh, we'll be at uh, a global trade of, of uh, 
uh, will be at 1,347 metric ton per annum and uh, 538 uh, uh, metric ton per annum of imports uh, all the way out to uh, 2030. Now, just to move on to where all this demand is coming from regionally, in China, since 2017, uh, they've been phasing out coal-fired heating systems to natural gas or uh, and replacing them with natural gas or electric systems. There's over 7 million additional households in the north that will be uh, switching over uh, from coal by the end of October, according to a, a draft plan that, that was just uh, released last week by the Environment Ministry there. Uh, although China's LNG demand is not based on natural gas-fired power demand uh, uh, largely, it, there's still currently 48 gigawatts of gas-fired development in, in China underway. And like in other Asian markets, natural gas is seen largely as a way to shut down the older inefficient industrial boilers, which are not economic to add expensive, expensive scrubbers like they have for so many of the larger coal-fired boilers uh, like they have over the last few years. Uh, China has a large build out of new natural gas pipelines that's tying into additional gas import ca capability from Russia and new LNG re regasification terminals and a growing domestic uh, production, which means LNG demand in China will not be growing at double digit growth rates like we've seen in the past several years. But despite the, the COVID related shutdowns earlier this year, China's LNG imports are on the rise and still expected to grow 4% this year, and, and that should improve next year as well. Just moving on to Asia at large, uh, developers are seeking, you know, liquefaction developers are seek seeking these long-term sales and purchase agreements for project financing, and they're keenly focused on, on Asia. Uh, while LNG demand in, in Japan is flat, and uh, we have seen recent long-term contract ex expirations with the Middle East uh, uh, open up new opportunities for U.S. LNG, it's one of the main reasons why uh, Japan was the largest buyer of U.S. LNG last month. Uh, China's demand is going to continue to grow rapidly, despite competition from pipeline supplies. Uh, in India, there's four new import terminals that are currently under construction, and progress is being made on infrastructure there. Uh, traditional exporters like uh, Malaysia and India, uh, Indonesia are continuing to develop gas to power uh, domestic demand in, in their, those, those countries, and LNG demand is growing at, at uh, pretty fast rates in, the, in those countries as well. And if you look at Southeast Asia alone, there's 167 metric ton per annum of regas development underway, and new terminals are expected to be completed next year in Myanmar, uh, Burma, uh, Thailand, and uh, Vietnam. Just looking at the Middle East, while overall LNG imports were down last year as Egypt transitioned back to LNG exports with the restart of the IDCU LNG liquefaction plant, Imports are expected to rise again as the Bahrain has entered the market this year by completing a, an FSU terminal. That's going to be followed by Kuwait's first permanent regas plant at Al Zor. And, uh, and Lebanon now plans to bring additional FSRU regas capacity in 2022. Also in Africa, there's, there's new gas to, uh, to power markets still being developed that are feasible due to attractive pricing. Uh, LNG can compete with imported diesel and other sources of energy, and, and, and it's a cleaner choice than coal, biomass, or diesel in that region. Uh, and there's still plans in place to add 30 gigawatts by 2030. Uh, so we, we still see uh, LNG demand growing in, in the Middle East and Africa over the, over the forecast period. In uh, Latin America, while this market's expected to remain flat, we could see imports return to 2015 levels by 2025 or 2027, uh, e even as we expect to see LNG import declines in Mexico and Argentina. Uh, uh, most of the demand is coming from Brazil, where there's 10 new import terminals in development. Uh, we're going to see the Porto uh, do a coup FSRU scheduled for start early next year. And uh, Colombia is going to continue to import more LNG as domestic production is, is still declining pretty rapidly there, and they're phasing out coal and fuel fired generation. Just looking at Europe, uh, Europe last year imports were up 75%. Uh, just looking at the International Gas Union data, uh, taking advantage of all the homeless car cargoes available from an oversupplied market. Uh, although LNG demand in Europe is not expected to increase over last year, the, the region still plays an important role in balancing the market with the 20% share of global imports. 
Uh, right now, there's over $10 billion in L&D terminal investment in 16 countries from Croatia to the UK that will keep that intact. Uh, most of this is an investment is more of an insurance policy to possible pipeline gas import dis disruptions or price increases. Uh, over time, uh, LNG imports into Europe are going are to decline as Nord Stream 2 and uh, Trans-Adriatic Pipeline ramp up production, but also as demand continues to improve in Asia, reducing homeless cargoes to, to absorb over time. Thanks, Shane, for, uh, for for taking us through those regional uh, reviews. Uh, very, very useful, very insightful. Um, Jesus, I'd like to bring you back in the discussion, if I may. Um, and it's really just kind of tying back to this uh, issue of, of soft demand um, and specifically what's happening in the U.S. Well, now, we've seen the U.S. Um, you know, rise very quickly to the, you know, to be the, you know, take the top three position in the world uh, in terms of you know, production capacity globally. What has actually the, the, the utilization rate been for this new fleet that's recently come on come online? Okay. Yeah. So just to restate, the U.S. currently has you know 69.8 million metric tons of uh, nameplate liquefaction capacity in operation today. At its peak back in late March, we reached about 90% uh, utilization um, over. On average for 2020, plant utilization was really around 70 per, uh, 70%. <clears throat> and I guess where we're getting some of those uh, those figures from is from another one of our widgets. This is our LNG feed gas widget. And basically, this, this particular tool takes great natural gas pipeline nominations to help illustrate the amount of natural gas that's going to each of the six existing LNG liquefaction plants. So it gives us you know, good perspective on utilization capacity of, of those terminals. Um, in addition to the flow data um, that you see here in, in the, on the chart, we also provide commentary to, to describe any significant changes or events that affect gas nominations, new train startups, maintenance, and then uh, weather and unplanned out other planned outages. <clears throat> So if we just kind of look at the chart a little bit, I did you know, add a couple of call outs, some, some highlights. Uh, again, you see the peak in, in late March where we reached that 9.8 9 BCF a day or 90% utilization of, of the existing fleet. But since then, volumes have been uh, been on decline. Obviously, most of this is attributed to COVID, um, but also the mild winter. Um, there were high natural gas, sto natural gas storage inventories in Europe and Asia, and then record low spot, record low spot prices, you know, just kind of made the situation worse. Um, as Shane had mentioned, there were some uh, homeless cargoes. You know, we had over 100, uh, 110 cargo can cancellations just in the U.S. Um, between June and August. Um, so <clears throat> you see a def that's where you see that significant drop off in uh, utilization rates. Then on top of that, we had uh, the hurricanes coming into the Gulf, and uh, specifically Hurricane Laura um, took Sabine Pass and Cameron LNG offline. Sabine Pass was off offline for 15 days. Um, that uh, that marks actually the first time that Chenier has ever shut that plant down um, since it's been been in operation. Obviously, there have been some train outages here and there, but that's the first time that that plant has been completely offline since uh, since it uh, began operations. Now, Cameron LNG, it's been offline for over 40 days. Um, they have actually restarted uh, train one. Um, power and everything has been restored to the to the area. Just two days ago, they were actually able to get their first tanker in there and uh, actually load a load of cargo. Um, so train one is uh, still uh, ramping up. The other two trains are, are uh, expected to follow over the next few few months. I mean, sorry, next few weeks. So we expect to see that plant you know, return to full um, full operations you know, relatively in a rel relatively short short term. And then the last thing on the on the table on the chart I want to highlight is Cove Point maintenance that they you know they went ahead and took that plant down um, for its annual maintenance. So through this tool, we're able to see see all those different events and how they in, impact the uh, utilization rates of these um, of the existing fleet. And as the new plants come online um, or new trains, as Sabine Pass Train Six comes online and Calcasieu Pass, we'll add those uh, new new trains and new plants to this uh, to this widget, so we could continue to extend that and just understand uh, again the utilization of those of those facilities. And then now I want to kind of, I guess, switch over and start looking at the liquefaction capacity build out here in the U.S. Um, so in our current view, you know, looking out to 2030, we really expect maybe only 10 percent of the $250 billion worth of a uh, capacity that's under development to, 
to actually move forward. So right now, I mean, there's 174 trains representing over $250 billion in capex spend proposed for development just in North America. This represents, you know, <clears throat> this totals 468 million metric tons of new capacity, you know, proposed again just in North America. The entire globe right now produces 440 million metric tons. So again, in the U.S., we're looking to looking to build more than currently exists all around the world. So that's why we're only expecting to see 10% of this uh, capacity to truly move forward. So looking at the table, those in green, those are already approved, are actually currently in construction. Below that are in orange. Those are the projects that we feel that are in the best position to um, reach a, a FID decision, and they currently have all FERC and uh, other permitting approvals uh, uh, in place. So those projects, again, those are the next ones that can move forward. We'll say I think that orange section continu is continuing to grow because these projects are getting through their permitting process and getting uh, held up in the FID um, portion right now. And then down below those in yellow, those are projects that have a formal application filed with FERC, and those are just currently going through that process. You know, at the beginning of this year, we did expect to see at least two projects uh, reach approval by the, by the end of this year, but we've seen a, a, quite a few delays that you know, we weren't expecting early, earlier in the year. So, for example, Freeport Train 4, they, they had KBR on board to actually uh, be their EPC contractor. KBR, since then, has decided to exit the LNG and a majority of the energy business. So that project uh, has uh, faced delays as they're seeking new contractor and still, I think, working on some of the commitments for supply, supply, supply agreements. And then also projects like Tullerian's Driftwood Project, that one also experienced another setback because of the uh, contract or the expiration of the supply agreement with Petronet in India, and then Magnolia LNG, Lake Charles LNG, both of those went through ownership changes um, with, uh, I think, the Australian-based LNG Limited selling selling the LNG the Magnolia LNG project to, to a New York-based development group, and then on Lake Charles we saw um, Shell make some changes with their uh, involvement in that project as well. Then going on to the next slide, to look at you know just the rest of the world and see where we expect to see a lot of this capacity take place. Because again, there's a lot proposed in the U.S., but this is a global market, so we do have to you know really step back and see and look at all the competing projects. It's not just those projects competing in the, in North America um, for a uh, for position in the market. It's, it, this is definitely a global market. Um, so again, when you really look at it, we're, we're expecting to see, you know, maybe 30, $36 billion worth of activity to move forward over, you know, to begin construction next year. And we've highlighted it in these, in these particular five or six, five projects. Um, and this is gonna add another 38 million metric tons of uh, capacity um, by I think, uh, 2026 when these uh, when these projects wrap up. So first off, we have you know Venture Global. They're still pr uh, pursuing forward with their first phase of, phase of the Calcasieu Pass LNG project, and we're expecting them just to follow up phase two and build out the rest of that facility and start construction on on that second phase relatively soon uh, over, over the next year or two. Then um, the Golden Pass LNG project, which is a joint venture between Exxon and Qatar Petroleum. They've, they've already indicated that they're going to uh, move forward with trains two and three at, uh, at their at their project. So and I th definitely think that's interesting because Qatar Qatar is making that huge investment at their at their main plant in Qatar, but they're also uh, diversifying a bit by uh, um, moving forward with the project here in the, in the U.S. as well. And then looking to uh, to the African region, look at Nigeria LNG. They're looking to form a significant bottleneck and uh add another train, train seven, and that's going to add another 8 million metric tons of uh, capacity to their to their plant. We're expecting that to move forward uh, next year. And then earlier, we mentioned how uh, Novatech is uh, being pretty aggressive in their expansion plans. They're they're looking to move forward with uh, phase two of their Arctic LNG project um, beginning next year as well. And then finally, um, Total, their Mozambique LNG project, they're actually performing site work and um, doing a lot of pre-construction activities. They're building, you know, docks and uh, just uh, man camps and infrastructure so that they could start uh, construction on that actual uh, project. However, we are expecting to see some uh, potential delays there just to just due to violence in the region and uh, significant security concerns. So um, I do know, I guess it was the CEO of Totals met up with the uh, officials in, in Mozambique and trying to understand how to better secure that area and uh, just make it a little make it safer so that it could pr proceed with construction of, the, of that of that project. Thanks, Jesus. Good. Mm -hmm.
Next slide, please, Shane. Uh, Shane, I'd, I'd like uh, I'd like to bring you back into the discussion. I think this is a really good slide because it kind of sums up what you, what we've called push and pull uh, the new built capacity. Now, you know, as we can see, there's a vast amount of new liquefaction capacity still kind of waiting in the wings. And you know, if if you're a betting man, you'd say, well, look, you know, demand currently soft. We've got very soft prices, landed prices. Um, we're starting to see some players exit and pull out of the market for, for different types of you know, myriad of reasons. Do we really think that the long-term demand outlook can really fully accommodate all of the capacity? It's not just coming out of the US, but you know, as we've just seen from Jesus, the new liquefaction capacity that's being developed elsewhere in the world. Can we really absorb all of that? Uh, no, uh, there's uh, uh, probably only 10% of the liquefaction capacity that's currently being proposed globally will ever see the light of day. Um, but uh, the long-term demand fundamentals are still in place. Um, uh, global demand for LNG is still expected to be 550 to 600 metric ton per annum by 2035. And, and to produce that, we're going to need to have 650 to 700 metric ton per annum of name, nameplate capacity in place. Uh, today, though, there's 430 metric ton per annum that's already operational. And uh, although we could see, you know, restarts of, of uh, additional capacity in Egypt and Yemen and some of the bottlenecks that are planned, uh, uh, you're going to need over 100 metric tons per annum to be approved by 2025 to meet uh, demand that's coming our way by 2030. And another 50 metric ton per annum by 2035. And uh, despite the challenges facing LNG developers this year, we do see FID approval is likely in the shorter term. Uh, there's, there's massive approval expected by Qatar uh, later this year. Uh, that that approval alone is going to be a major headwind for U.S. Uh, LNG FIDs in the coming year. Is the uh, supply gap that we see forming in 2027 is going to be largely filled by that uh, Qatar gas expansion. As far as U.S. LNG, we still expect to see at least two projects uh, approved uh, in the next year, and that's included in our forecast for uh, 2021. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Shane. So this this is actually looking at you know, how we're going to how or which projects we are expecting to move forward to fill that supply gap that uh, Shane is Shane just mentioned. So what we've done, we've looked at all the projects in our database and and identified you know how much capital investment is going to be required to fill that capacity uh, capacity void. So out of that $150 billion of, of projects under development, we've kind of whittled this down to those projects that we feel that have a higher probability moving forward based off of, you know, <clears throat> our internal research methodology and metrics and understanding what's going on in the market and which owners and developers are most are best positioned to move forward. So, from that 150 billion dollars, we've brought, we've able to been able to bring that down to about 47 billion dollars worth of spend, um, beyond uh, the 43 billion that's already reached FID. So we're expecting another 47 billion, which is that blue that blue sliver there, to move forward um, over the next 24 to 36 months. And then anything outside of that window, the rest of those projects in yellow up there, we really don't see much of that uh, able to move forward till sometime. Uh, beyond 2030, um, again, just because of the, the, the vast amounts of uh, capacity coming online. And then I uh, think we're going to start to see the, mar the market balance out once we see more of those uh, products come into service. And then, uh, Shane, if you go to the next slide, yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the unprecedented impact from COVID has resulted in, you know, just several delays and sanctioning, you know, proposed LNG projects that were expected to be part of the of that second wave of, of projects, including several in the U.S. You know, the delays in, in reaching FID, most, uh, mostly because of a lack of long-term sales agreements, um, could lead to a you know, supply-demand gap that you know, Shane uh, explained earlier. And as he uh, already illustrated that, you know, Qatar is going to make up a big chunk of that with uh, the project, their large project they're going to move forward with. Um, but when you look at the North American projects, we still see, you know, Sh Chenier and their uh, Corpus Christi train three, uh, stage three project. 
Um, SEMPRA has two projects uh, proposed right now. I think uh, those two projects are going to uh, move forward. They have uh, their Coastal Azul project as well as one in Port Arthur. Um, interesting note on the Coastal Azul project, um, the president of Mexico has actually come back to them and basically in order for them to receive you know, their export permit for Coastal Azul, which will actually be a first of its kind for a private owner to be able to export gas from, from Mexico, he's also requested that Sempra and their uh, partner Innova build a second terminal or export facility um, to export gas from near the Gulf of California. So in order for them to build that one project, he wants them to build a, a second. So it's kind of interesting that he's a, uh, kind of putting that as a contingency for, for them to receive that permit. And then uh, also, also interestingly, just yesterday, maybe the day before, uh, the government themselves between Pemex, CFE, and <clears throat> just the Mexican government, they've also, they've announced their own privately funded LNG export facility um, to be built to be built as well. So I'm not sure if that's going to be in addition to Coastal Azul or if that's going to, if they're actually trying to replace the Coastal Azul project. But I, I think that's uh, going to be re pretty interesting to see how that plays out uh, across those uh, across those projects. And then, in addition to that, I uh, mentioned you know Venture Global. They're uh, moving forward with their uh, Calcasieu Pass project. We are expecting them to get a FID on their uh, Plaquemine project uh, relatively soon. Um, again, over the next couple of years. And then uh, Novatex, other project, the Opsky LNG project, expecting that one to uh, receive a FID approval as well in, in the next coming years. So with that, you know, we're looking at another 83 million metric tons per annum, you know, the, that $47 billion worth of spend <clears throat> expected to be approved over the next uh, next coming years. And then on the next slide, what we've done is taken our forecast and spread it out across what we call a duration model. So this is basically taking that total investment value and spreading those dollars throughout the life cycle of the project. So if you look at a graph, basically over in gray, you can see what's happened in the past you know, how those dollars were allocated, you know, I think it's beginning back in 2010. And then looking at the blue ch blue section, that's taking those same, taking those projects that we expect to move forward that have already reached a FID and are going to move, and we expect to move forward shortly. Those are, that's that blue section, and we've modeled that out so you can see how those, again, how that how those dollars be uh, modeled or spread across the whole entire life cycle of that project. Um, and then I'd left in that orange section, just so you can see if everything was approved, I think it's a yellow chart before, now it's orange on this one, but uh, that yellow section, now it's orange, but uh, you can see if everything was to move forward, just how massive that, that wave is of uh, dollars to be spent and just kind of understand how unrealistic it is to see that much activity um, move forward, um, just, cause, just compared to what we've done in the past, you know, since, coming since 2010. But we definitely do see, a, you know, a, a new wave, another wave of LNG capacity, is, you know, is clearly there. As, as Shane mentioned, looking at the supply gap forecast, we're still going to uh, see some FIDs. I think it's going to slow down from where it was where it was over the past few years. Um, these companies, they're not they're not going to want to. They don't have that same appetite for those big long term deals as they did um, previously. I'm going to expect to see a lot more, a lot more smaller players. Uh, and shorter contracts, a lot more flexibility uh, built into some of these. But we are also seeing, you know, emerging markets continue to continue to come into play and help uh, absorb some of this uh, capacity that's being brought online. And uh, again, we still just expect to see a, a relatively healthy market in the in in the LNG sector. Just you know, won't be as big as it was, you know, as it was before, but we are still expecting to see a, a healthy market. And I don't know if, I'm sure Shane has more he wants to add as far as the conclusion, just to kind of wrap up. Well, I mean, we definitely see um, another 100 metric ton per annum of projects moving glo forward globally over um, over the next 10 year period. And uh, uh, as far as our forecast for FID approvals, it's our crystal ball is not that great when it comes to the standpoint that the projects that are under development in North America do require uh, long-term contracts, which are just not going to be there in today's market. And uh, so really, uh, developers are, are going to have to uh, switch to portfolio players uh, to, uh, to sign these long-term contracts with them, uh, which uh, right now, those same portfolio players are cutting back on CapEx spending 
uh, in the near term. So we don't see a lot of uh, long-term contracts available uh, in the in the next year. So it, it could be 2022 before when we say you know there could be two projects receiving FID. It could be 2022 before FID. Great, thank you guys. Um, wow, we got through an awful lot of content there and uh, really appreciate you guys sharing your insights and perspectives. But before I let you escape, I'd like to keep you on the line a little longer. We've got a couple of questions, a couple of minutes we could uh, you know, go through a few questions that we've had coming in. Um, and in no particular order, I'm just gonna rattle through some things that have just uh, been passed over to me. Um, I want to go back to this sort of cost. I guess it's more around cost. You mentioned about cost, mobility, flexibility, and it's around floating facilities. Do you see an increasing shift towards uh, floating projects versus onshore projects? I guess that's going over to you, Shane. Thank you. I, I, I do. And the cost of these floating facilities are coming down, and and they're they're. Uh, a much smaller, uh, their availability is on a much smaller scale as well, which is enabling gas to, uh, gas to power projects uh, near shore of uh, smaller islands across Southeast Asia. You're seeing it, uh, 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 quite a few projects being developed in Indonesia where we're talking about regasification capacities of less than 100,000 tons per annum and uh, with these new technologies. So uh, it really is an, uh, an enabler for bringing gas-fired power in areas where, where you couldn't do that uh, with onshore developments. Uh, FSRUs in general are more flexible. They can be built in six to nine months. They're a lot less uh, uh, upfront investment capital to, to be deployed uh, in comparison to an onshore term terminal, and, and in many cases, you'll see one of those roll in, and uh, the phase two would be the uh, switch over to uh, an onshore terminal. If the market is going to be there for the next uh, uh, 30 to 40 years, you could see an onshore uh, terminal being uh, developed. Uh, I think in the in the near term, most of the projects moving forward will be FSRU based, though. Okay, thanks, Shay. Uh, I've got some project specific. Um, questions coming in. I'll go on from Gabriel. What is the status of Gorgon LNG? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that one. So on Gorgon, I know that train two is still down. Um, they're still having issues with the welds on on the heat exchanger there. I think that it's been offline probably about four months now. And I know that date keeps on getting extended. They were supposed to be done in September, then it got pushed to October. And last we've heard, they've actually extended out to mid to late November as far as the restart date. Um, so we're expecting that they will uh, be able to complete that uh, by the time, in the, within the time period that they've uh, set this time around. And then we also know that trains one and three will go through a similar process. Um, I think train one is supposed to go down within the next few weeks, but I suspect that that's going to be delayed so it doesn't overlap with what's going on with train two. So I think both of the, uh, basically both of those turnarounds are going to be pushed back accordingly, depending on how long it takes them to complete the work on, on train two. And then I would suspect that those sub subsequent trains, their outages won't be as long. They're scheduled to be about 30 to 45 days, but uh, so far this train two uh, outage has been about, like I said, about maybe four months. So. Uh, Hopefully, there's you know some lessons learned, and they're able to apply that to those next uh, next two trains. If it's a very similar, sounds like it's going to be a very similar issue. So hopefully, they can shorten that uh that that time period. But I mean, honestly, I mean, if you have a plant down, I think now is probably one of the better times to have it down with the uh, excess capacity that was in the market, the lower prices. You know, um, you, you never want your plant down, but now is probably the, the better, you know, one of the more optimal times to have that that plant out of service, um, <clears throat> just so you're not you know missing out on as much. Uh, and I guess this one's for you as well, Jesus. The uh, the uh, question from Joe is: the wood fiber project in British Columbia uh, likely to meet the construction targets? Um, I think there will be some delays on that on on that project. I think it will be um, delayed somewhat by a few months, but uh, I think overall it's not going to slip too much. Um, but just because of, I think of. Some of these other projects, uh, just with everything going on with COVID and uh, manpower issues uh, or manpower restrictions and uh, just uh, safe work practices, 
um, some of these projects are going to be uh, extended a bit just because you are because there's just less, less manpower um, on, on site, or at least there was for a few months. Most of these projects are trying to ramp that up as, as they, uh, again, understand better how to understand better how to rotate people in and out and extend uh, and extend work hours. Um, I do expect this project to move forward, but it will slip a little bit, but not by much, I don't think. Right, this one's open to whoever first taker. Uh, question from Jason: Why does Cove Point schedule its maintenance at the end of the summer uh, when storage levels are potentially full? Does it go back to it being an import terminal, and they've just not adjusted themselves? Uh, seeing uh, during peak demand summers, power burn would be uh, a much smarter time to do it. So I guess this is really about: Do they have a unique maintenance scheduling uh, specific to that plant? Yeah, so they're, they're, that's the one plant that is very uh, routine. Every year they go down at the same exact time, which makes it a little easier on us to understand their outages. But uh, they do flip back to an import terminal during the winter. Um, so I, I think this is the, the beginning of that of that of that process where the liquefaction um, train is not as as it's not needed um, as they like clearly stated. The tanks are full; they have the capacity there. So if they need. So they are still able to load cargoes um, to fulfill contracts, but once the the cooler weather does come in, that facility does uh, flip over and uh, return to its original intent of a uh, import terminal. Okay, um, Jesus, I think it was you who talked about the Mexican government um, request. The uh, we've got a question here from Heather. She'd like some further clarification. Can you go back over the Costa Azul? Okay. Uh, potential yeah sure so right now Sempra and Inova are applying for an export permit to build the Coastal Azul uh, export facility or add liquefaction to their existing import terminal uh, the president AMLO he has added a condition to the receipt of that permit um, for them to actually build another liquefaction project to take advantage of gas that they're um, importing from the U.S. There's a pipeline that uh, was built a few years ago going to a particular part of Mexico that is at this time uh, unfinished. There's nothing at the end of that pipeline. Well, he's proposing that they build a new export facility in addition to Costa Azul um, so that they could so that they could take advantage of the of that cheap feedstock coming out of the U.S. and uh, export that export gas from, from there as well. So he's trying to, you know, Take advantage of cheap feedstocks. Utilize a pipeline that um, is not uh, being that's not currently utilized. Only uh, issue is he's making that a seems like he's making that a condition to receive for them to receive the approval for their original originally proposed project. So it's uh, kind of unique that the he's added that uh, condition to their to their approval process. But um, this is the same. Uh, same president that there was a, I think it's a, I don't remember, it was a CERTA Texas pipeline, but TransCanada had negotiated a, a particular project, pipeline project with the previous administration, received permits, everything was approved. When he came into power, he said, our project cost too much. We're not going to build it. This contract is void and we're going to have to renegotiate the whole thing or you guys just don't build it. Um, and that's exactly what happened, TransCanada. Um, and, and his administration renegotiated, brought the cost down, and then they moved forward with that project. So he's um, very involved with the negotiations of, uh, you know, infrastructure and, and private infrastructure in, uh, in his country. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the clarification and the, the further detail, Jesus. Uh, Shane, mm -hmm. question for you. Um, we've obviously seen rig counts pull back uh, in the shell plays. Uh, so will the drop in I guess U.S. production volumes or drilling activity certainly will that have any kind of impact on I guess rebalancing supply at the moment? Yeah, we are seeing a drop off in associated gas production uh, from the the shell plays in in, in North America, uh, and, and a lack of drilling activity, and, and we saw a, a million barrels per day of oil drop off, but also a lot of uh, the associated gas production, and the problem with that is, is that the associated gas production coming out of the oil plays in, in West Texas, New Mexico, or some of the cheapest gas in the world, and you don't want that production to drop off. That's what uh, 
is a big enabler for uh, uh, U.S. LNG project development. Um, it's it's um, we're not going to have a, a, a sustainable gas price feed gas price in in the below two dollar range without growing amounts of associated gas production out of the crude oil plays. If we're going to bring in uh, all the gas, feed gas into LNG liquefaction in the U.S. from just gas-related fields, uh, that price tag is going to be over $3. And uh, and that makes uh, U.S. LNG a little bit less competitive with projects being developed as, elsewhere. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sticking with the theme a little bit, uh, a question from Kire. Uh, do you think that LNG developers will have to change their commercial model based on recent announcements from two large EPC contractors who are exiting EPC lump sum arena. So, and do you think overall construction contracting strategies, do you think they're going to have to change and develop further? Uh, I, you know, the KBR decision that I'm aware of is, is you know, they've been doing feed studies for many, many years and um, they were making more money in the meantime in other markets, and so they pulled out their their LNG division. Uh, whether or not that means that existing develop, uh, developers have to change their their uh, contracts, I'm not really sure of that. The lump, lump sum turnkey seems to work. Uh, the, uh, the the big change is, you know, how are they going to to reach FID and how are they going to go to market and and convince uh, de-risk the project to the point without obtaining long-term um, uh, sales and purchase agreements? So that's going to be the big challenge going ahead for U.S. developers. Okay, Shane. Oh, actually, either one of you here. I think this is going. A question from George. Um, going back to the waves. Um, what type of impact to demand recovery to, to the de demand recovery timeline for LNG? Do you anticipate there should be yeah. uh, from the second wave? I'm going to go back. Can you say and that again? Look at those waves. Yeah. Um, uh, what what is what type of impact to the demand recovery timeline for LNG do you anticipate there should be for a second wave? So what what do you think when, when for, for this second wave to move forward? Um, you know, do, do we see it existing at this particular time point or will it get pushed out because we're seeing lower demand? I think that's what the question is. Yeah, yeah the, the, the necessary decisions that will have to be made, the projects that will have to be FID'd to meet uh, the supply demand and balance is, is most likely going to be more closer towards the completion of the, of the Qatar expansion. And uh, so we could see a two to three year delay, at least in FIDs and, and other markets, uh, if the Qatar expansion is is, is approved. Because, it, again, we see that, that gap forming uh, in 2027, and that's right around the timeline when Qatar's major expansion will be coming online. And that'll extend that out uh, a few more years. And uh, But if you have your – if you're able to get long-term contracts in place, you can move forward with your project. And uh, there are – uh, you know, uh, portfolio players that are developing, uh, you know, regasification projects, demand a new uh, new uh, emerging markets, and uh, uh, they're going to be looking to uh, to sign contracts to feed these shorter term contracts that they're developing. And uh, so there are opportunities that are going to be forming uh, over the next couple of years. It's just going to uh, take time for that to develop. And uh, so we're seeing, uh, if if you compare where we were a year ago, at least a two year delay in that. Uh, at this time, uh, so 20, 2023 uh, uh, would be a more likely time frame for uh, you know seeing FIDs move forward in uh, in the markets such as North America or any additional FIDs out of uh, Africa or, or the Middle East beyond the uh, uh, Qatar gas expansion. Great, and guys, I couldn't let you go without asking a question about your forthcoming election. Uh, obviously, we've got two candidates on, I guess you could say, either end of the oil and gas appetite spectrum, for want of a better phrase. Uh, what kind of impact would you see if the pendulous, pendulum swung way or the other? Or what, what's your view on, uh, on the outcome? I'm not necessarily well, asking I'd... your opinion on who's going to win, uh, but <laughs> if we saw, if, you know, if we saw uh, President Trump's staying, staying position, obviously very supportive, 
a new candidate, probably less so. Could you just explain a little bit why that is going to be the case? Well, uh, two different issues that I look at, you know, going forward with uh, uh, with this election, and one is um, no matter who wins the election, I do feel like the uh, trade relations with China will improve. On the one hand, uh, some of that stalled ahead of the election, and once the election has been resolved, I think trade relations with China will start to improve after that, no matter who wins. Uh, if uh, there is the, uh, the possibility that if a Biden administration uh, gets into office, we could see uh, a halt to drilling activity in federal lands, which could slow down uh, associated gas production coming out of the crude oil plays out of New Mexico. Uh, uh, so that that uh, that could definitely impact um, the viability of, of U.S. LNG projects moving forward if the election swings in that direction. Okay, great. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, if we could just flip to the final slide, uh, really just to say a couple of thank yous. Uh, firstly, um, next one, please, Shane. Yeah, firstly, to both of you, thank you very much. Uh, quite an exhaustive uh, session and uh, an awful lot of content we got through, but uh, really appreciate you sharing your insights and perspectives today. Many thanks, guys. Uh, and also um, a very big thank you to uh, our webinar sponsors, the folks over at ITT Gould Pumps. And just to recap what these folks do, uh, they are clearly the most widely recognized and respected brands in the global pump industry, well-known brand out there, uh, servicing not just the oil and gas sector, uh, but also uh, servicing the needs of mining, power generation, chemicals, pulp and paper, and general industry as well. Um, and they're really one of the only manufacturers to make digital monitoring standards on every process pump that they have. So uh, very much leaders in the market. Thank you very much for your support, guys, over at Google Pumps. Many thanks. And a big thanks again to you two guys. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.